everybody got quiet, so that means it's time to start, don't it? <laughs> Y'all want to get underway and get out. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, uh, I'll oblige you. I'll get us underway and then get us out here in just a little bit. Uh, thank you for being here. Good to see each and every one of you and hope that your week is going well. Um, beautiful weather today and think the promise is for more of the same tomorrow. So uh, interesting. We're going to be in Luke 17 uh, tonight and uh, I'll move kind of quickly, the Lord willing, with this lesson that we have. Before I do get underway, though, let's ask the Lord's blessings upon our time and give him thanks for his uh, wonderful blessings in our lives. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that we have the privilege to come again tonight to Benham Baptist Church. We're thankful for the faithfulness of these folks to come and be with us on Wednesday night and to share in the study of your word fellowshipping with one another, and just enjoying your blessings. You have bestowed abundant of blessings upon us, and we are so very, very grateful. In this season of Thanksgiving, we give you praise and honor for all that you do in our lives. And Lord, we ask that you bless in our time together this evening. For me, it goes so fast. And uh, I pray, Father, that it will be helpful, that we will be able to share words that encourage our hearts and uplift our spirits, and uh, we'll just give you praise and thanks for all that you continue to do these things we humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, this is, as you know, our... Last thanks or our last Wednesday evening of meeting in the in the month of November, because we will not be meeting next week, uh, according to our schedule. So don't forget that. And I want to share uh, with you tonight regarding Thanksgiving, and uh, we will not uh, finish uh, looking at this passage of scripture in Luke chapter 17. So we'll come back to it. Sunday morning, the Lord willing, and look at the second portion of it. So don't think I'm leaving out something very, very important. Uh, we're going to get to more of that which is important come Sunday morning, the Lord willing, and I hope that you can come and be with us. Uh, interesting passage of Scripture for me here in Luke 17, starting with verse 11, and you know the story well of the healing of the ten lepers. Let's look at what is stated. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now that's just kind of about half of the reading here. So we'll look forward to getting the other half come Sunday morning, the Lord willing. I don't have to tell you, you know from your study of the scriptures that uh, wherever Jesus went, he always took advantage of the opportunities that came his way to exercise his wonderful compassion upon those that he came in contact with and display the power of God that was able to be displayed by him uh, to uh, those folks. Definitely in this situation here, we find that to be the case and for me, it's, as I said a few minutes ago, it's just a, a wonderful little passage. And as uh, Steve and I and Paula, we talk about Tyler Golden every once in a while. As Tyler Golden says, I'm going to go somewhere now. <laughs> Initially, it might not seem like I'm going to go somewhere, but with the help of the Lord, we're going to try to go somewhere and see if we can't... Uh, 
learn something here or at least be reminded of something that will help us. I think the actions of the Lord Jesus here in this passage of Scripture brought about the performing of a miracle worthy of thanksgiving. And so as we review what we are able to glean from this passage, I want us to ultimately draw a parallel with what is occurring here. And I hope that as we draw that parallel at the end of our few minutes together, that it will enhance our uh, expressions of uh, thankfulness unto the Lord, uh, not only tonight, but every day of our future, and especially next week whenever we celebrate Thanksgiving. But I say this a lot at this time of year, Thanksgiving really should be something that we do every single day, 365 days of the year, not just on <clears throat> the uh, fourth Thursday in November. So there's four things I want us to note here. Uh, first of all, I want us to note from verse 12 that this was a very pitiful situation uh, described. Again, he entered into a certain village and Luke says there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. Um, these ten men had what was known as a very dreaded disease at that particular time. And all ten of them were bound together in a, or with a common misery. Uh, for at that time, lepers... Uh, were relegated to uh, colonies where they came together and that's where they lived. Um, and so these ten were together and there they stood experiencing the misery that was theirs associated with this disease that was so dreaded at that particular time. Uh, they had that disease of leprosy. And I'll talk about that momentarily. And the point that we need to understand about that is that these ten men were absolutely helpless to do anything about their situation. There was no known cure at that time, no help for them, and it was just a pitiful sight. Um... By definition, as I looked it up in the World Book Dictionary, leprosy is a chronic, mildly infectious bacterial disease characterized by ulcers and white scaly scabs. Today, it's known as Hansen's disease. I, I don't hear much about it. I don't know whether any of you have heard anything about it. Um, I, I just don't hear about it these days. But if we go back in time and we place ourselves in the, in the position of where these men were in time, then there were certain rules and guidelines that they were bound by. They had to follow these guidelines uh, specifically. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46, says that uh, they had to dwell alone and be without the camp. That means that they were not able to be among uh, those that were dwelling inside the camp uh, as it related to the children of Israel, as it related to the time of Christ. They were not able to dwell where everybody else was dwelling and meal about with everybody else. They had to dwell alone, be by themselves. I am told that it was also required of them that if someone was approaching them and saw them uh, and were coming upon them, they must cry out, unclean, unclean, so that others would know not to get very close to them because the disease of leprosy 
was quite contagious. Now, the words used in the dictionary was mildly infectious, but apparently because of the lack of uh, medicines and so forth at that time and medical understanding uh, without being able to properly treat that disease, no one wanted to catch that disease. And so those who had contacted the, the disease were required to let everybody else know um, that they were unclean because that's what the disease made them, unclean. Um, their, their body with that um, condition, the, the white scaly scabs and so forth, and the ulcers, you can imagine what that uh, looked like at that particular time without the, the ability of modern medicine like we have today to help with those kind of situations. So to me, as I think about this, um, a lifestyle like that would have been one that would have been sad indeed, right? Sad situation, and that's why we can say that it, uh, it's a pitiful situation. A pitiful sight is described here in this passage. Don't forget that because we're going to use that again to draw a parallel. Secondly, I share with you that we need to note that when we study the Bible and we come across the word uh, leprosy or we look at situations like this, uh, you know there are a lot of types in the Bible, and leprosy is a type of sin. Hopefully you all know that from uh, prior studies and so forth, but it is a type of sin. And so to all of us who are students of uh, the scriptures, and we study and we research and we try to learn what we can about what is being taught, the... We, we know that the comparisons of leprosy and sin are very clear in the scripture. And at the same time, I would say that they are very thought-provoking. Makes me think, stop and meditate on things. For, you see, what I believe is that, uh, like leprosy, sin brings uncleanness in the lives of uh, uh, every person, for we are all born in sin, uh, according to what the scripture tells us. And we have that old nature of Adam that we have to contend with, and we have to deal with the problem of sin in our lives. So it brings uncleanness in the lives of every man, woman, boy, and girl that has not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. So that compares it to leprosy. Like leprosy, sin brings separation. Uh, I've talked about separation in, in other messages in prior years uh, concerning how sin will separate. Uh, it will separate a husband from a wife. It will separate parents from children. It will separate a pastor from congregational members, sin a lot of times will separate. And we certainly are able to see because of these men standing afar off and being separated from everybody else that lived in the area, uh, how it parallels that of sin. The fact that they had the leprosy that caused them to be separated, sin sometimes bring separation as well. Like leprosy, sin is humanly incurable. Humanly incurable. I could not cure my sin. You could not cure, uh, cure your sin. It took divine intervention, right? That was the only way. And so it was in the case of these men, it took divine intervention to bring about a cleansing for them. So the lepers in this story had much in common with all sinful men, women, boys, and girls uh, from then until now and those prior. It, commonality. Um, and as they were all without hope, 
so are sinners without Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope, right? Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Paul talked about being in a situation of having no hope, but he was addressing the Gentiles and comparing them with the Jews. And here's what he had to say in Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 11. I'll just read it for you. You won't have to turn unless you want to, but you have the scripture reference on your notes there. Paul said these words, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So what he's saying is the Jews call you, they're the circumcised, they call you the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. And he goes further that at that time you were without Christ. In that situation, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. See, a person without Christ has no hope. The Gentiles had no hope until Paul turned and directed the message to the Gentiles as God directed him to do so. And thankfully, that message came on down to you and me today. To God be the glory, the praise, and the honor for all of that. But he says here, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. I praise God for the blood of Christ. I'm thankful for the blood of Christ. One of the many things that I am so very thankful for tonight is the blood of Christ that has cleansed me from all sin. And I know you join with me in being thankful for that. But just remember whenever you read about leprosy in the Bible, recognize it as being a type of sin. Um, thirdly, I want us to note that the earnest, there was an earnest plea that was made by these individuals, these ten men. They pleaded earnestly, verse 13. They lifted up their voices. Um, and I suspect that, that uh, those voices were loud. There was a very distinct plea that they offered, and it was in unison, no doubt. Um, there may have been seconds of delay between the voices so that there was not necessarily absolute harmony like we sing in harmony uh, in the choir. But nevertheless, they made this plea unto the Lord and their plea was specific. They said, Master, have mercy on us. What a plea. Master, have mercy on us. I suggest unto us that that was a plea that came from their innermost being. It came from the heart. They wanted their situation to be remedied. No doubt about it. No doubt they wanted to go back to their homes and live with their families and be among the general population and enjoy the privilege of doing so, but they knew that they couldn't do that. And no doubt they had heard about Jesus and they had heard about some of the miracles that he had already performed. That was probably very heavy upon their mind when they looked in the distance and they saw him. And so they lifted up their voices and they pleaded, Master, have mercy on us. It was a plea for mercy. A plea for mercy. Now they didn't say, and you know I'm not trying to uh, argue a point here. I'm just trying to say simply this. They didn't say, Jesus, we want you to heal us. They simply said, have mercy. Have mercy. And mercy 
brings about that expression from the Lord of special favor that is not deserved that comes about through his amazing grace. It was a plea, I believe, for the Lord to work a miracle because they knew most likely that he had worked miracles in other situations and had made uh, some things occur that were very, very unusual in nature. And so they pleaded. And, beloved, that's the kind of plea that is required from every person that is convicted of their sin and realizes their need of a Savior. They must plead for God to extend mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ and cover sin with his precious blood that was shed on the cross. So the fourth point that I bring out to us tonight is found in verse 14, and that is the response of the Lord, the response of the Lord. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. Interesting expression. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to heal you. Now think about this. He didn't say, look at your skin to see if I've done what needs to be done or what you are asking me to do. He said, go show yourselves unto the priest. Interesting, right? A very interesting statement on the part of the Lord. His response involved instant compassion on his part, I believe. He heard the pleas of these ten men. And in response to their pleas, he provides this very seemingly strange instruction. Why? Why did he do that? Okay, let me answer that question for you because it's interesting. It comes from Old Testament instruction. In the Old Testament, the law authorized priests only to declare a person unclean from leprosy. Jesus was familiar with that. Now, what did he say about his coming? I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. So it was right on uh, target for him to say to these men, go show yourself to the priest. Let them look at you and determine whether you are clean or not. He was fulfilling Old Testament scripture. Don't know if you've ever seen that in that passage or not, but that's exactly what he was doing. But I think there's a deeper significance here. And I think it rests in the fact that Jesus was simply saying unto them, if you believe that I can and I am healing you, then go show yourselves to the priest who themselves have condemned you and separated you from everybody else so that they can see for themselves that you are clean. That was the real purpose. But two things were required by these ten men. Two things were required. It's like uh, when Naaman came to... Uh, the prophet, and he was told to go um, dip in Jordan seven times. He didn't like that, did he? He didn't want to do that. <clears throat> he said, aren't there other rivers here that are cleaner than that old river? And, and I can go wash in them. But his servant said, the master said, go and dip in the Jordan. And he went and dipped, and he came up clean. What was his disease? Leprosy. What are we talking about? Leprosy. Okay. All right. Uh, so 
just as the prophet instructed Naaman, so did Jesus instruct these ten men here. And just as was true with Naaman, these ten men had to meet these two requirements. Number one, they had to exercise faith in the very words of Jesus. They had to believe that what Jesus told them was the very thing that they needed to do. Now, what if, what if one of them would have done like folks do today? Well, I shouldn't get off on that tangent, should I? You know, folks today, whenever you say, you know, you, you go and you do this, children even today, when you say, you go do this, I'm not going to do that. You have no right to tell me. These men could have looked at Jesus and said, you have no right to tell me to go to the priest. I come to you. I want you to heal me. And yet Jesus said, go to the priest. These men had to believe what Jesus said. And the second thing, they had to obey what Jesus said. They had to believe and they had to obey. Naaman had to believe what the prophet said and he had to obey what the prophet said. Pretty simple, right? Uh, that's what it took. Um, so the miracle occurred, I believe, whenever they took that first step. When they started, I don't know where the priests were. The Bible doesn't tell us where the priests were. Probably somewhere around uh, where the temple was located or the house of worship. Maybe that's what we should call it at this point. And uh, they were probably in and, in and around the house of worship. And so they started in the direction of the house of worship to find the priest and let the priest look at their skin and make the determination. The miracle occurred when they took that first step moving in that direction, right? That's, that's awesome. And all of these men in Luke's account experienced a miracle worthy of giving thanks unto the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I close, I told you we would draw a parallel. And I hope this will uh, be encouraging to you and exciting to you as well. The story of the lepers here in Luke convey unto us a real message of our life. It helps us to understand what our life was prior to being saved, right? We were in sin. We were, from a spiritual per perspective, we might not have been someone that looked like a druggie. We may not have had on uh, shabby clothes or anything like that. We might have been respectfully dressed or respectably dressed. Uh, we might have been uh, an individual that looked respectable in every way, but uh, truthfully, uh, we were a pitiful sight spiritually because sin had us in bondage. Prior to being saved, sin had me in bondage and I was in its clutches. But thank God the Holy Spirit convinced me of my need of a Savior. And that night, whenever I was convinced that I needed to be saved from my sin and delivered from its bondage, I made a plea, an earnest plea. Lord, I want you to save me. Please save me. Please save me. You went down that road too, didn't you? Lord, please save me. Please bestow your mercy and your forgiveness upon me. In our youthfulness at the time, we may not have, and we didn't say the words exactly the same way that we say them now, obviously. But nevertheless, it was a plea, and it was a plea that came from 
our innermost being, from our heart, as we were asking the Lord to save us from our sin. And what happened? Jesus responded by washing us with his precious blood. That night, whenever I called upon him to be my Savior, he washed me as white as snow. He forgave me of my sin, cast them into the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered against me no more. Wow. I became a recipient of the miracle of salvation, and that's worthy of thanksgiving. The miracle of salvation is worthy of thanksgiving. Let us never forget that our gracious Lord deserves thanksgiving and praise every single day of the year for the miracle of redemption that he has performed in our heart and life. Not a soul, not one of us was worthy. He was merciful. He was gracious. He was compassionate. He was kind. He performed the miracle. We didn't. He performed the miracle. Let us be thankful this Thanksgiving season for that great miracle of redemption that he performed in our life all those years ago. I truly am grateful tonight. I really am. Sunday morning, the Lord willing, we're going to look at the second half of this story because it's interesting. So I hope that you will read the remaining verses down through verse 19. Come back and be with us, and we have a whole lot to talk about, a whole lot to talk about, uh, about being thankful uh, in this Thanksgiving season unto the Lord. Thank you, Father, for the miracle of salvation. Thank you for your leadership in our lives every day. Thank you for how you walk with us, you guide, you direct us. And in those days, whenever we are stressed and carrying a heavy load, you provide help and strength for us. In those days when we're on the mountaintop, so to speak, you bless us so abundantly with such rich blessings as the light of your love shines in our lives. I pray that you will help us to always be a very thankful people for your abundant blessings. And indeed tonight, thank you for the miracle of salvation by grace through faith in your finished work on the cross of Calvary. I can never thank you enough for taking my place on the cross. To you be all the glory and the honor given, I humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>